you for um, joining us today and putting up with my technology issues. I'm going to give you a few housekeeping notes um, before we get started. And I want to let you know that um, participant microphones like mine earlier and videos will be turned off during the program. If you have any questions for our speakers, we ask that you submit them using the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. We will be monitoring the questions throughout and sharing them with the, the speakers throughout in addition to the Q&A section at the end of the program. Also note that we are offering both closed captioning and Spanish language translation for today's program. And those are located at the bottom of your toolbar. I also want to thank American Airlines and our Central Division, who is our Central Division sponsor, and all of our community partners for your support of this program. This is a very important topic, and one ADL has been fighting since we began and were founded in 1913 in a response to the escalating climate of anti-Semitism and bigotry. Our mission is to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment to all. Today's panelists know firsthand how hate hurts, and they will share their stories with us today. It is my pleasure and our pleasure at ADL to welcome our speakers. We have Rabbi Emily Hyatt, President, at, President of Rocky Mountain Rabbis and Cantors and Associate Rabbi at Temple Emmanuel, Denver. We also have Jacqueline Levy, who is the Executive Director and CEO of Wash U Hillel. And we also have, who might, she might be running a little bit late. Um, she had a little um, conflict today. Tracy Wilder, former CIA officer and FBI special agent, as well as author of The Unexpected Spy. And of course, Lauren Post is the analyst for ADL Center on Extremism, who is our moderator today. Moderator today. Lauren and everyone, thank you very much for joining us. Lauren, I'm going to pass it over to you to get the program started. Great. Thank you so much, Margie. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, everyone, so much for being here today. Margie, thank you so much for organizing, American Airlines for sponsoring. All right. Let's get this started. Um, if you don't know who I am, and I'm going to assume uh, that's probably most of you. Uh, my name is Lauren Post. I'm an analyst with the Center on Extremism. I uh, help track anti-Israel activity in the community, more specifically uh, in the corporate world. It's intense, definitely not without its challenges. And I feel very lucky to work with some of the brightest folks in the business, um, in the tracking, mitigating, and educating about the impacts of extremism around the country. Uh, my colleagues at the Center on Extremism are doing really incredible work uh, tracking these incidents. Um, and I'm really, really thrilled today to talking with to be talking with my other ADL colleagues and other community leaders about the psychological impacts of hate in our community. Uh, this is a really heavy topic, and I personally find though that there's actually so much to be really hopeful for. So I just wanted to start this off framing it a little bit with the numbers. Um, this is uh, we're going to be talking about the impact beyond the numbers, but we should probably have a general frame of reference for what those numbers are. Um, so just really quickly, in 2021, white supremacist propaganda remained at historic highs in the U.S. Last year marked the second highest level of incidents reported since the EDL began tracking such data. We're averaging 13 incidents of white supremacist propaganda a day. We recorded 352 propaganda incidents um, that included over anti-Semitic language or specifically targeted uh, Jewish institutions. This is a 27% increase um, of 20 of 27% increase from 276 incidents in uh, 2020. Many of these white supremacist groups are dialing up hateful rhetoric against Jews, canvassing entire communities with hateful literature. This is kind of an alarming trend. We probably know the Goyam Defense League and some of their shenanigans. Um, they're posted overnight usually and their propaganda ranges from veiled white supremacist language to explicitly racist images. Um, and then incidents of harassment, vandalism, or assault that incorporated anti-Israel and or anti-Zionist themes, um, we included these in our audit if they express classic anti-Jewish uh, animus. Um, in 2021, 345 anti-Semitic incidents fell into this category. It's a 94% increase from 178 in 2020. Though we should probably note that May 2021, the whole conflict with Hamas and Gaza really influenced uh, events in the diaspora. So we feel that this probably are, those two things are connected. 
Um, and then on campus, the, we tallied uh, this year for 2021-2022 academic year. Um, one is physical assault, 11 instances of vandalism, nine instances of harassment, um, 165 protest less actions, and 20 BDS resolutions and referenda. Um, many, but not all of those incidents could be classified as anti-Semitic. Um, so in some, we live in a, a world right now um, where extremists, uh, extremism, though, is most likely going to come from the left, but also it's coming from, uh, or from the right rather, but it's also coming from the left as well in specific spaces. So that's a lot of numbers. I just threw a lot of statistics at you, but that's on purpose. Um, too often these statistics get cited, they're devoid of a broader context. And without a sense of the individuals experiencing these incidents, so today I want to talk with my ADL colleagues and community leaders and add more context and personalization to these numbers that we hear so often. So this is a question for everybody. Um, we're in the middle of Elul. This is a month of reflection, return and repair before the high holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So with that in mind, what is on your mind regarding anti-Semitism and understanding how it impacts your communities? And if there's any experiences from the past year or so that really illustrate for you how hard macro microaggressions are or straight up acts of hate can impact you or your community? Well, I'm happy to start. First, can everybody hear me? Somebody give me a thumbs up. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, I'm Rabbi Emily Hyatt. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this conversation. I think it's a really important conversation. Um, like Margie said, I am uh, from Denver, Colorado. I'm a native here. Um, and um, and I'm a associate rabbi at a pretty um, large congregation. And I'll tell you, as we're entering into Elul, which is the month that precedes, uh, well, we're we're actually we're mostly done with Elul, the month that precedes the high holidays. Well, excuse me, will I panic over here? Um, we are getting ready to um, invite our congregants into our building for Rosh Hashanah, our New Year celebration, and for Yom Kippur, which is our um, very incredibly holy day of introspection and repentance. And um, I'll tell you, we haven't had this many people in our building since 2019, because even though we were present uh, physically, a lot of our congregants for the high holidays last year, um, we were outside because there was a COVID resurgence right around this time. And so we threw up a tent and went outside. And so this is the first time that we have this many people coming together and we feel it. We feel it in a, in a lot of ways as we get ready for this moment. We feel it in like the enthusiasm and excitement for togetherness and community. And we feel it that we're out of practice of what it feels like to have this many people together. And right, like that's, that's the world is different than it was in 2019 in a lot of ways. And so just reimagining the um, the beauty and some of the trepidation, I think, that comes with having that many people together um, is both really important. We miss it. Um, and we're conscious of just, just how different that feels, right? When we're all at home alone in our spaces, it's a different feeling than when we're all together for good and for bad. Thank you, Rabbi. That's really, really insightful. Um, Jackie, did you, I know you work on Hillel, and so I was wondering if you have any insights into what you're thinking about the high holidays and how anti-Semitism emerges on campus. Sure, thank you. And Rabbi Hyatt, that's, it's, it's so exciting and also so daunting, you know? Uh, and Lauren, yes. I, wanted, I wanted to thank you for, for sharing those statistics. And for those of you who may not have been on at the beginning, my name is Jackie Levy and I'm the CEO at the Hillel at Washington University in St. Louis. And, uh, you know, what I'm thinking about is that Hillel is uh, soon approaching our centennial. And for nearly a hundred years, we've built and worked very hard to foster strong Jewish communities on campuses throughout North America and um, multiple continents. And now for the first time in our recent memory, many Jewish students are feeling isolated and unsafe and Hillel is being forced to address anti-Semitism from every angle. You know, and that said, I don't, I don't wanna be too alarmist because we all see those, um, uh, headlines that come up when we have really explicit 
macro forms of uh, anti-Israel sentiment and anti-Semitism that rise to the, the, the covers of the, our papers and, and social media. We just saw most recently the graffiti, the first days of school at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, we just found out last week as it was announced the federal investigation into the pervasive and prevalent anti-Semitism that students in the Jewish community have been experiencing at the University of Vermont. Uh, and so we certainly have those kinds of situations and headlines, but for the most part, for the majority of Jewish students, anti-Semitism is not omnipresent in that way. I like to refer to it more as a, a latent a latent anti-Semitism or uh, in, in many ways, ignorance that our students are facing and these various microaggressions that we're hearing much more about and that are becoming much more prevalent. And it could be something like a professor who is singling out Israel uh, in a course that has nothing to do with the conflict. Uh, it could be that students in a, in a student organization or in a conversation with peers or in some other very public way are facing this kind of um, erasive anti-Semitism where they're being told um, you know, distorted narratives about their own Jewish history and they're being silenced in, uh, in, in how they define their own identities and anti-Semitism and their own experiences with marginalization. And so as a Hillel professional trying to hold all that on top of all the other work that we're trying to do to foster a Jewish community at this time of celebration and reflection and introspection, it's a lot and our jobs are continuing to, um, to evolve as we, as we address these, these issues in, in significant ways like never before. That's Just really to, follow, to, to add to what Jackie has to say, I think that, um, I, I think that so much of the work probably that she and I both do is not about necessarily, though there's certainly part of it to, talk, to think about the practical, right? Like the security and the reporting and the training and, um, and the responding. And there's a huge, huge amount of what we do that is about sort of the holding, right? Of each of the students and the community members that we have that feel like they have um, been othered or wronged or explicitly right attacked in some way and what does that mean for them and how do we get them through that and um and i think we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we get through this um, but that's a the, the pastoral piece of this uh which i don't think um you know we ever really even going into this work i don't think i ever really understood quite what it means to steward someone through the process of responding to uh, someone making them feel other. Uh, and that's a huge piece of it as well. For sure. Thank you for sharing both of those insights. They're really powerful and I think really important, especially as we're going through the high holidays. So just everyone be kind to your rabbis and cantors and staff that are hosting these things. It's really, really stressful. So be kind, yes, uh, and keep these things in mind as we're looking through uh, or getting through the, the Hagim. Um, so going on to the second question, uh, Rabbi, this is for you. We were prepping for this event uh, last week and you had this really beautiful recollection of the community response to the Tree of Life massacre. Um, and I'm wondering if you can just briefly go through that memory again for us now and then add perhaps what you learned from the experience about what allyship meant to you and also the psychological impacts of what that kind of support felt like in that moment and now how you remember it. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So, you know, we were, when we were thinking about what's the framework for this conversation of the psychological impact of these moments of experiencing anti-Semitism or experiencing any kind of hate, one of the things that immediately pops into my head um, is I, I started here at Temple Emmanuel in 2018. And uh, shortly following that, we all experienced the enormous tragedy of what happened in Pittsburgh at the Tree of Life 
um, a, a synagogue and the attack there. And in the days that followed, there was um, an immediate need to, in every community, I have to imagine, and certainly in the Denver and the Front Range community here in Colorado to gather. And so Temple Emmanuel, because we are a building that can accommodate, we, we decided that we would host and we opened our doors. And um, we at that time could fit about, I don't know, 1,750 people in our sanctuary. And uh, we had thousands, th thousands of people showed up for a vigil and memorial and just solidarity moment in the days following Pittsburgh. And um, I, I will, I have, I have chills just thinking about what it felt like to be in that sanctuary. There were people in the aisles, there were people sm smushed into the back um, of the room. Eventually we piped audio into our social hall and started filling the social hall. and. Um, what I learned is that we needed a place to go and we needed a place to be together. And it seems obvious and yet it was so crucial that the Jewish community be together. But actually what I learned had very little to do with the Jewish community because there were um, members of and representatives of so many faiths that were there and faith leaders that spoke and brought their communities and filled those seats and the aisles also. And they were also like sitting on the floor and right. And people in their religious dress that made it clear that this was not just about the Jewish community. And I specifically remember the Sikh community um, made chai tea and they were in the lobby so that when you left, you had something warm to drink. Right, like I love that so much. Chai tea in Dixie cups for thousands, because being there isn't just about showing up and isn't just right. And and in the in the Jewish community, we know that in our heads. What do you do when someone else is hurt? You visit them. What do you do when someone dies? You visit. What do we do when anybody is in need? You go. You show up. But to see that in this broad sort of way, what it what it did was remind me that actually the power of community and allyship and standing together was unbelievably important. And so in all of these attacks that have followed tragically, right? I say that both sort of tragic, yes, because people have died and tragic because that's what our world is right now. All of a sudden I knew in my head that you show up, right? You show up outside mosques and make sure that people get to pray and you show up in all kinds of religious institutions and gathering places for queer communities and for um, communities of other races and ethnicities when they are the ones that are being threatened or when their people have been threatened it's not about them it's about all of us and so now we show right we show up and I think that what are the psychological impacts of hate? I think that they are lessened when you know that you have friends and people who will stand with you and people who are gonna stand next to you. And the question is how do we continue to build those relationships and make them in times of trauma for sure and the rest of the time also so that we're not just together when we're hurting but we're together when we're celebrating as well. Yeah, I love that. That really resonates with me um, in terms of just like building relationships around the year. Like our community shouldn't be oriented necessarily around just the trauma. Like we can pick so many different incidences and yet our tradition is rooted in so much joy as well. So that I really love that of finding the places of joy and making an effort to build with joy. Um, yeah, so Jackie, being on campus, I love campus. I used to work on campus um, for those who probably, the majority of you who probably don't know, I used to work on campus. So this space is near and dear to my heart. Um, you had also mentioned in this prep meeting, um, the kind of difficulties of working with students who are experiencing anti-Semitism for the first time. They kind of, some of them, but not all of them come from a bubble. They went to day school. They went to schools in heavily Jewish areas. And they're coming onto campus and it's not necessarily always bad, but it is challenging and it is new. So what do you tell those students? How do you help them through, help steward, guide them through some of the new things that they are experiencing, especially when it is actually anti-Semitic? 
Yeah, thank you. Before before I answer that great question, I, I did want to just go back on, on what Rabbi Hyatt was sharing. And that I, you know, that coalition building and the relationship building is such an important piece of what we do in the Jewish community and what, what we try to do more of because so often we're reactive. And I, I think if we were able to shift the lens or shift the framework to really within our community have a better understanding that by, by forging more of those common bonds and dialogue and opportunities for, for deeper cooperative understanding, we're actually working to eradicate anti-Semitism. Like if we were able to change the narrative around that kind of work that we're not just in it to learn about one another, et cetera, but that, that, that it is also a strategic, it's a strategic thing to do. Um, and it's, it's really important for our communities and also in the microcosm of our campus community, working with our Jewish student leaders to do the same so that when they're feeling marginalized, they can call upon their peers and say, well, remember then, you know, this is, we're here for you. And there's that, 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 that sharing. Um, but to your question, Lauren, and I would say it's not just the students who come from a day school background who, uh, you know, may, may be living in a bubble that they have a large Jewish community and now for the first time on a college campus away from their parents, they're faced with a really icky situation. But it's also maybe a student who doesn't have a really strong Jewish identity, um, who may be at a school with a smaller Jewish, you know, a large school with a very small Jewish population for the first time because of their Jewish identity, they're being forced to speak on behalf of the entire Jewish community, right? And how overwhelming, so how overwhelming of a burden that can be for a student from an array of backgrounds. And I think first and foremost, the, the, the important message that we wanna convey is that Hillel is here for them. Hillel is here for every student, whether there's a Hillel on your campus or not. I mean, there's Hillel International and there are many other resources like the ADL and local synagogues and congregations and others that students should feel um, will be there for them that they can reach out to. And it's uh, both about being present with them as Rabbi Hyatt shared at the beginning in that moment to hold with them the pain, that, that the burden, the, that just that, that feeling of being wrong, that something's some, maybe they can't put their finger on it, that they, they might not recognize that this, this, this rises to this cross the line, this rose to a level of anti-Semitism, but it just doesn't sit right. It doesn't feel right. And to have a sounding board in, a, in a, a Jewish communal professional who can hold that with them and talk through it. And then in addition, who can help them navigate the situation and advocate for them as well. And I think that that's so important of, um, that's so important about what our role is uh, because we can help them initiate a bias incident report within the university. If it rises to a certain level, we can uh, help them um, navigate the, the judicial code of conduct on their campus or work with their campus police. Um, we can make a report with the ADL and then we can work with the university administration, not just to alert them to the situation that happened in, in that reactive moment, but also help start to create a platform similar to what we do at, at Washington University and what my peers do at a, at, at a number of other campuses in helping to train the administration, the student affairs uh, staff, provost office, uh, uh, faculty department heads um, to share that, uh, to, to, to share about Jewish identity, to share about Jewish inclusion and to talk about uh, what anti-Semitism looks like uh, what anti-Israel sentiment is and when it when it crosses the line into anti-Semitism, and so that's 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 really the role uh, Hillel as an as as an educational model, um, and not just not just purely support, but that educational role is key. That's really really helpful about thinking about how campus is specifically um, impacted. Uh, Emily, I'm, Rabbi Emily, I'm a little. I'm also wondering, like, are there strategies that you employ in community when you're working through? Like, Jackie said that she helps with bias reports and navigating the judicial system. So, like, what do you do in the community to help navigate, like, the tangible, the tangibles of figuring out what to do with incidents? Yeah, 
It's a good question. Well, first of all, we have uh, a really wonderful relationship with our ADL here uh, in Denver, the Southwest region, and we love them. And we're so grateful for them and for their help in um, helping us navigate all kinds of things. And so usually if somebody comes and talks to me and says like, here's the thing that happened, I'm like, awesome, hold on, <laughs> right? Which is exactly the point because it means that each of us has our own expertise and resources and we know exactly who to call, which is what Jackie's thing, right? It's the relationships that we build and the networks that we have that allow us all to navigate together. And so I think that that's a really important piece of it. Um, part of what I'm thinking about and what I think, you know, I'm seeing, I know we're not answering the questions that are coming in yet, but just in glancing at them, one of the things that I'm seeing is like, how do we prepare people for this? Which I think is a really important question. And as a rabbi, I really hold that question. I teach confirmation. So I spent a lot of time with 10th graders in my role uh, who, right, they're, they're going to go to college, but not yet. And, um, and what I'm noticing is that most of them are not experiencing things right now that would, that make them think about anti-Semitism. Most of them are not even really experiencing that line between anti-Israel um, and Israel, right? Like healthy Israel criticism, which, right, is a line that we're trying to teach. And most of them, they're just not thinking about it at all. And one of the things that I am trying to do on my end is simultaneously without, right? I have a six-year-old. I'm going to pause my story and tell you. I have a six-year-old. I spend a lot of time trying to make sure that I am preparing him for the world. Right, that he knows what to do and that he's safe and that he has good instincts and that he knows how to navigate all of the things that might happen to him. And at the same time, not scaring the heck out of him and telling him like, here are all the things that you're not allowed to do. Don't get in a car with a stranger. Don't talk to people that you don't know. Don't do this, don't do that. Be afraid of this here, right? Because God forbid, right? He's gonna walk through the world. There's a lot to be afraid of. And it's the same thing with kids that are a full 10 years older than him. I want them to have all of the things that they need inside them to handle what comes at them both now and when they get to wash you and they hang out with Jackie, right? I want them to know what they need to do and to be prepared for that. And I don't want to terrify them. It's a hard balance. How do we handle that? We strengthen their Jewish identity and strengthen, right? This, this goes for not just anti-Semitism, but for any kind of identity, strengthen your identity, make you feel surrounded and supported and strong in knowing and believing who you are so that it doesn't feel like the first moment that it gets attacked, that you can't hold on to it, that you, you, you know it. And it's not something that you're afraid to defend. And at the same time, give them education and background in a way that feels safe so that they do know how to recognize what is and is not anti-Semitism and they do know who to talk to about those moments when they feel like those things are happening. Those, that, that's my strategy um, is to do both at the same time. And I almost put more emphasis on the identity piece than I do on the preparation piece because if their identity is strong, then they know that we're there for them and that they have their clergy at home. They have their Jewish professionals on campus. They have ADL offices around you know, the country that they can be in touch with for the things that they need. Uh, as they navigate all of this. Um, I think, I think that we can um, help kids today understand the landscape of what it is that they are looking for in the world, also in generalities, right? Be kind, be accepting be open to who people are and what they have to bring to the table and be firm in what you believe the world is supposed to be. So when someone shows up at your lunch table and it's someone you know, and maybe it's even somebody Jewish and they make a joke or they make a statement that feels to you like it has crossed a line, don't just sit there. And it doesn't mean that you have to call the ADL because the kid sitting next to you at the lunch table, right? You can, but mm -hmm. it also means that you have it within you the strength to say, you know what? That is not funny. It makes you look dumb, right? That's it. 
just to say a little bit of something to someone to be like, I'm not interested in that joke. I think that that is like a little embarrassing that you think that that's funny. And right, they have within them this vision of the world that isn't full of what we're trying to fight. And uh, what a concept that would be if we just filled them with that. I love that. I love the, I really, really love the idea of instilling in kids uh, a Jewish identity. I think a lot of the interesting intra-community stuff would be solved if we put a little more emphasis on Jewish identity. So that's great. Great to know I have a like-minded traveler in that. Um, <laughs> um, so I kind of have a different question going a little bit but maybe potentially not off that beautiful, beautiful thought. Um, we were prepping for this, right? We did a lot of prep for this. Um, and one thing that kept coming up was this generational divide around anti-Semitism. Um, different generations experience anti-Semitism differently. We identify anti-Semitism differently. And I think we're psychologically impacted differently because our frame of reference is different. So I'm curious how you both navigate those divides writ large. Jackie, you want to start? You want me to start? Sure. I'm, I'm happy to. I think one of the mo most glaring differences is social media, right? And particularly for our students, uh, you, you spoke earlier about the students who come from a day school background or those who are very confident that the, the, the students who feel very secure in their Jewish identity as Rabbi Hyatt eloquently shared. And what we're experiencing is that when there is some post, uh, you know, we, we had a situation earlier last year with the Wash U Black Palestinian Liberation Organization posting some really challenging content on Instagram and watching our really bright and talented students. I mean, these are the future leaders of our Jewish community who feel very equipped and have the skills to, to respond to those kinds of uh, posts they take that burden very personally, that the weight, of, um, the weight of representing the Jewish people and defending Israel and the Jewish people sits with them. And they'll stay up all hours of the night. And often these will like coincide with midterms and exams. And it's just nonstop with you know, social media, with trolls and people who are not, frankly, are not interested in engaging in conversation despite our students' best efforts to try to have them meet them halfway to, to talk and to try to build some form of dialogue. And you know, students won't sleep. And then that fatigue leads to, you know, the, then challenges with their diet and um, just their, that their mood will change because they're not getting enough adequate sleep and they're getting stressed with um, their academic coursework. And so it just exacerbates into this very toxic cycle and uh, it's not healthy. And there's certainly a correlation between the, you know, the pervasiveness of all kinds of things, obviously on social media, but because we're on this particular topic with anti-Semitism between this and the, the, the real crisis uh, 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 within the college student community and young adults and mental health, there really is. Yeah, I would, I would, I would add to that, and and especially the idea of social media, which which is like so right, so much to tackle in general. Um, but one of the things that that means is that there are shared generational understandings of the world, and while there may be sort of like a Jewish community understanding, I also think that there are large right the the amount of like one generation at another generation and how they interact with each other, especially on social media. And, um, and that is kind of remarkable. And that comes up in a lot of ways. Like we're seeing a lot in like fashion trends and right, like the nineties are back, but differently. And okay, it's a lot to absorb as a person who grew up in the nineties, but that's fine. Um, the two thousands for me that are really, really hurting my soul, but neither here nor there. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, so much flannel is returning to my life. Um, I think that one of the things that that feels like to me, though, is that there are real solid shared generational identities and they're really different from each other. 
And one of the ways that I really perceive that is in the difference between people who have lived to see certain experiences or lived through them and people who haven't, right? And for everybody on this webinar, I'm imagining that you can sort of imagine, right? I have to imagine that most of us are um, um, probably people who were alive during September 11th and have some general knowledge of that. And if you think about that, there is a pre 9-11 reality and a post 9-11 reality, right? That is so different. And it's not just about taking off our shoes in the airport. It's, it's massively more consuming of our culture than that. And so too, there's a generation that, that not as much anymore, because we know that we're losing them because time passes, but there's a generation that saw World War II, that saw the Holocaust, that lived it and suffered through it. And then there's a generation who was raised by parents who lived it. And then there's my generation who maybe had parents who, right, who had, who had grandparents that were um, impacted so directly by World War II and the Holocaust but who didn't live it and who didn't live it in my home, right? I was raised by parents that were born in the fifties. They missed it. They, they, they don't know a world. My parents don't know a world without Israel. They don't know a world in which, right? Europe is the thirties and forties Europe. And that manifests in so many different ways. And now we've got, you know, the generation of my children who are, the, they're four or five generations away from that experience, which means that we've still got grandparents that won't go to Germany and won't buy Volkswagens or BMWs and who, right, who, who still see that as the forefront of the fight and who can't, and who know that that kind of violence and hatred exists, they know it in a different part of like their kishkas, their guts, right? And then if you're five generations from that, you just don't know it. You don't know it. And so maybe there's Pittsburgh and maybe there's September 11th in your understanding of the world, but also there's not. And so that tension between those who live in a world where they still fear a return to 1930s Germany who, who see that as a thing that is possible because they knew it as a reality and generations that believe that we're so far from there that we could never go back. And that's a tension, that's a tension. And, and um, I see it so much when I explain to people that are often younger than me, uh, like why are other generations afraid of anti-Semitism when they feel like they're pretty, when, you know, when these kids feel like they're pretty safe in the world. And so we have to hold the whole of recent history in our hands when we answer that question. And it goes right back to it. How do we educate about that in a way that matters without living in fear and without teaching our kids that they have to live in fear? How do we educate about that in a way that makes them want to build a world that's better rather than fear a world that's worse? And, uh, it's a really fine balance, I think, to help them figure out how to build that world. Yeah, that really reminds me too. Um, I have quite a few family and friends who are uh, Persian Jewish, and so their trauma is much more recent than even the Holocaust. And I have quite a few friends from the former Soviet Union, and their trauma is, you know, oriented around the 80s and the 90s and the collapse of the USSR. And so this is not this is them, like they are either from themselves, the USSR, from, you know, Iran, and so, and or it's their parents that have this trauma, and it's not some distant thing, it's, you know, them, yeah. and they're navigating a completely other conversation around how do we hold our identity, how do we be this third culture kid, and so that's like, they experience anti-Semitism very, very differently, at least in my experience, and so psychologically, they're in a very different place because their sense of safety is completely different and their frame of reference is totally different than a lot of, uh, I think, more American, yeah, they're more American, purely American uh, Jewish communities, which I find really interesting. Um, and that's kind of an interesting space to navigate as well. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for widening, right? That conversation past just sort of like these giant big, but, and and I think that that, that adds another dimension of what does it feel like to be a part of a, uh, of a, 
generation that you're not aligned with because you didn't grow up in exactly the same way, right? And, and how do you navigate that when you feel it differently in your home than you would? Yeah. Definitely. Jackie, do you just have anything? Add, yeah, I would, I would just add that also, you know, without that pride in the creation of the state of Israel, right? Being so forefront on the minds of this generation, what they're seeing is so much negativity around Israel's military might and not knowing for many of them, uh, you know, the, 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 the specifics of Israel, the Israeli, the Israeli political um, situation, et cetera, and not knowing how to respond um, with, with like really, when, when there is really biased anti-Israel sentiment that does cross the line, not, you know, not knowing how to, how to navigate that situation. Um, and there that, you know, people are falsely equating, uh, you know, Israel's defense strategies and military with Ashkenazi, you know, white privilege here in the United States. And it's not a, a, an accurate comparison. And it's hard to then put that on, uh, you know, on a, on a college student today to, or a teen to navigate that, that really challenging um, conversation. For sure, it's an interesting space, and I'm not envious of younger younger folks, younger than I am. Um, growing up in a world completely dominated by social media, I can still remember like that heinous dial-up connection call. I have, yeah, yeah uh, that's what I remember growing up on the internet, and that's my version of it. So I'm not envious of those who can't conceive of a world um, without it. Um, I have one more question before we move uh, to the Q&A, and this is kind of a conglomeration of a lot of questions you've been getting and what folks asked in their registration forms, but how do you handle challenging conversations, um, especially within the Jewish community when you don't agree on something like Israel or with those you don't agree or are not within the community? And how do you know when this is a conversation worth engaging with, or this is just a troll and block and goodbye? What a good and hard question. Um, there's not a universal answer, I think, to that. One of the things that I've learned as a rabbi and as a clergy person is, and this is hard, this, this was a hard lesson to learn as a, as a, I don't know, a human and, and a mom is that often my job when I'm talking to someone is not to fix it and to disengage from the need to fix what is happening with someone else changes my whole role in the conversation with them. Rather, my job is to listen and to reflect back and to help people think perhaps about things that they haven't thought about yet and to widen their perspective and maybe occasionally to offer a perspective or two that might inch toward a solution if it feels like there's a really obvious one, I don't know. And that's, I think, not that different in some of these conversations that we have where if we are not coming into the conversation imagining that our job is to convince somebody of something else, which is probably a really important piece of like dialogue in general these days, and if we come in thinking, all right, I'm in this conversation, regardless of whether I should be or not, <laughs> here I am. And perhaps I'm just gonna listen so that I can better understand who this person is and where they're coming from. And then I can decide what I wanna do with the information that I've been given. Is my job to fight back? And sometimes it is. Is my job to walk away because this is unhealthy and unsafe and sometimes it is. Or is my job somewhere in the middle where actually there is constructive dialogue to be held here? And this is an opportunity to share and to, um, to build a relationship perhaps of differing perspectives. Um, that is an exciting place to be when you discover that that is a, a place to be, but you can't always know which conversation you're in until you're in it. I can guarantee you that the internet is not gonna be a place for anything except for uh, bad, right? Walking away. And I tell my confirmation students that all the time, like do not engage with people that you don't know on the internet. It's never, it's never worthwhile. It turns out because 
they don't see you as a human and you can't see them as a human. You are screen names, you are letters and you're right. You're two dimensional at best. And that's not how we build relationships and worlds of peace. That's how we build, right? The ability to um, say things that we might not say to a three-dimensional person. So I think that that's, that's my framework first and foremost is um, what am I going to get out of this? And am I going to have an impact? And is it going to be good for me? And is there a way out of this that feels like it is advancing the betterment of this person or myself or the world? And if not, how do I get out of it? And that's a really important, I think, framework. I know that that answer is probably different for Jackie, who is thinking about a, right, like a, like a campus culture that exists where walking away might mean that that it, problem just exists for somebody else then. And so I don't know if you feel like that looks different when you're talking about sort of a, a, a city with walls. You know, I really don't think so. I, first of all, Rabbi Hai, that was beautiful. And I, I mean, Yashar Koach, that was beautiful. If we could all go into those kinds of conversations with your approach in the back of our minds and in our students' minds. But I think that ability that, that, that using, especially in, in a campus environment, that the, the goal here is the pursuit of knowledge and education, right? And to go in with that open mindset of, of active listening and trying to find opportunities for common ground. And that, that, that giving our students the ability, that, that the freedom, the carte blanche to say that it's okay to disengage, I think is really important. I think in the college environment, and, and what I would like to see more being done within the Jewish community, because our students have so much either feeling that they're not equipped to be um, in those conversations in a, in a, in a, in a that, that they don't feel that like they have all the facts, right? And that they can't go in and defend their identity or the, the Israeli experience and the, the ways that they would like, they, they just will shy away from it, right? And they don't wanna be part of that conversation. And so can our community do more to create, and, and this is what Hillel's do, to create safe and supportive opportunities for Jewish students first to have some of that intra-group dialogue, to put out some of the challenging issues that are facing the community and have students be able to be in conversation with one another from a spectrum of opinion and perspective within our own Jewish community where there's no fear of cancel culture, right? Where, where they can where they can ask a question and not be afraid that uh, they're gonna be, you know, called ignorant or that they're gonna be called stupid or that they're, you know, that there's no dumb question and have an educator who is equipped to really be able to foster that kind of dialogue. And then within a university culture, be able to create better forms of, of intergroup dialogue in a, in a very, um, intentional and strategic way and give our students the tools within the campus environment to be engaging in those conversations so that when they go out into the world as adults, they have those skills to be able to engage in those conversations on their own. Yeah, I love that. And I would just say, I think that, I think that um, a big part of those skills is not about knowing facts. It's not about being able to right like, retrace the history of the state of Israel and where the right and the wrong is and and be able to convince someone that where they see wrong, it's actually right. I think that that's the opposite of the skills that they need in order to have these conversations. I think that feeling confident in their understanding of where they come from and 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 also like, you know, confident that they have some general historical basis for what they're talking about, but also a lot of this is about actually dialogue and listening, which is not to say, oh, the way that you're explaining this, I don't agree with that. Let me give you a different historical perspective, but rather to say, it sounds like this really hurts you to think about this. That's so beautiful. Tell me more about why it hurts you to imagine that this is how, you know, that this is what's happening. And maybe we can, right? Like, let's, let's think together about what actually we're talking about, right? And to engage, not that that's the answer to everything, but what if we weren't just fighting 
fact on fact, because we know that actually they don't all, right? Like that that history is um, perspective. And, and so what's the goal of those conversations for your students and what kind of training do they need in order to be able to feel confident? I don't know. Okay, that works really beautifully as a transition to the next question um, that I have. And this will be my last question. I think I've left some time for maybe one or two Q&A. Why don't you let me know? Um, so <laughs> how do we go forward? We've talked a lot today about how this impacts the communities and what we're seeing on the ground, but what, what are we doing now, one? Two, what can we do going forward to be proactive about this? Like, what do you think we should be doing that would uh, beneficially impact our communities? Well, I, it, for me, it comes down to one word, which is education, right? I, I mean, it's all about how we are educating the next generation to be navigating these situations and, and to have their have a strong Jewish identity to go into these situations and um, and, and go out into the world. And so it, 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 and even backtracking that one step for one step back is that you know there are a ton of resources for families of teens to look at uh, the campus climate at the universities that they're exploring, uh, the sizes of their Jewish populations. And I think it's, you know, for, for families that are, are apprehensive about these issues or nervous about them, you know, go to the Hillel International uh, Guide, College Guide, um, do the homework, do the research to find out where, not only where your, where your child is going to feel um, most comfortable from an extracurricular academic standpoint, but where they're going to feel comfortable as a Jew, right? And I, that that really needs to be at the forefront uh, if if the, these issues are important to you and your family and your child. And then I think that educational piece that so much more can be done within our communities with partnerships with our synagogues, Hillel's, youth groups, local JCRCs, JCCs and federations with the ADL to help prepare our students for the, the campus climates that they may ultimately be enrolled in. I, I love that because I think that, uh, you know, I just, one word is, uh, and I agree with your word and I would add a second word because my instinct is that the first answer is community, right? To, to, um, to know that you're not alone in this. And um, so much of the experience that I um, have seen of feeling anti-Semitism or feeling incidents of hate or targeting um, of young people and of grownups uh, is isolation. And we know that the right back to the title of our session, the psychological impact of that kind of isolation and that kind of othering is huge. And the trauma that comes from that is really significant. And so knowing who is on your team and who is in your toolbox when you have that experience and knowing that there are amazing mental health professionals that are in our community that can help with that, those feelings, uh, whatever they may be that come from these kinds of incidents and however they manifest, knowing that you have clergy that has um, really good references, like that's really like so there for the first conversations and the connections <laughs> and will refer you to people that can help you. Knowing um, that sometimes just like we started after Pittsburgh, right? Like just being surrounded by people who want to show their love and support and demonstrate that kind of solidarity that 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 right what fights isolation is that kind of love and community and togetherness and those relationships and so i think that um uh it couldn't be i think a better sort of conclusion to this jackie that that we're each going to continue to do this work and we're going to do it from um, really, you know, different spaces. Um, and that if at the end of the day, what we're doing is creating generations, hopefully, of people who really do, who really do envision a world where we're not having these kinds of conversations and where we don't have to um, have this kind of webinar and maybe they're building a world in which we have not just the desire, but the capacity, right? So the 
strength of community and the knowledge and the education that allows us to, um, to just build a little bit better in every generation um, and hopefully, I don't know, come out with, um, come out with a vision of something that, uh, that perhaps gives us a little bit of hope. Uh, that's the goal. That is I love that goal. so deeply. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, I love that too, especially as we head into Rosh Hashanah and the Jewish New Year. And sadly, um, I do have to say that we are out of time. We had a lot of questions. Lauren, uh, Rabbi Emily, Jackie, I want to thank you all for participating. I want to thank all of our attendees. Uh, we had a lot of great questions. Some of them got peppered into the program uh, as Lauren was moderating, but we didn't get to all of them. So I apologize for not getting to all of them. They were really great questions. Um, but, you know, I, I want to thank everybody and, and our speakers for their candid stories and information. It's so important to hear. I also want to thank our American Airlines, our sponsor, American Airlines, and our community partners for everything that they did um, in helping with this program. And as we heard today, there are a lot of personal and emotional impact uh, when hate hurts and when you are uh, faced with anti-Semitism. And so uh, there were some good tips. This program was recorded. We will be sharing the link to the recording um, with all of you and we will be posting it on our YouTube channel. We'll also share some resources that you can use hopefully. And um, even though we struggle through the pains of hate and anti-Semitism, it's real. In just a few days, as we mentioned, Jews around the world will be celebrating Rosh Hashanah, we'll be eating apples and honey, and we'll be welcoming in the Jewish New Year with hopes that it will be a sweet and prosperous, uh, prosperous year. And with that, I want to say again, thank you very much for joining us. Shana Tova. We wish you all a very happy, healthy, and sweet new year. Thank you for joining us today.